buying and building core. And when and when those markets get done, um, they're going to move to the, to the other ones. And and I guess as we looked at this morning, Atlanta is uh, is one of the other ones, and hopefully it's one of the early ones. You know, can I give a quick example of of that? Um, we two days after we closed Campanile or 1155 to John, uh, we sold an asset down in the CBD of Fort Lauderdale called La Sola Center. It's a two-building, double-A um, office complex, 91% leased. A year ago, you know, my, everybody who wants to be in South Florida wants to be in Miami. And what happened was during the summer as we're marketing the asset, just the market moved from a capital market standpoint. Equity moved and the debt markets really moved big time. And so instead of a year ago, we would have eight, maybe nine, ten offers. We ended up getting 28 offers on the asset. I thought wildest of uh, dreams we would sell the asset for $150 million, which is about a seven cap. We ended up selling it for $170 million, which was a 6-4 cap in Fort Lauderdale, the CBD of Fort Lauderdale, which is a very, very small market. Um, I'm trying to give example. It's probably the size of, uh, you know, it's a little bit bigger than Decatur, but it's a very small Class A office market. Yeah, exactly. And and because the capital was getting priced out of the gateway markets, they wanted to go to South Florida. They would normally go to Miami and not want to buy in Fort Lauderdale or Palm Beach or Boca. We saw the capital move in order just to acquire the real estate. And at that pricing at a 6-4 cap, that's not too far off where the peak would have been for that asset. So if you hear somebody say, well, pricing's off 40 percent, not true. You know, pricing's probably off 15 to 20 percent depending upon the market. And so that's a good example of already happening to South Florida. And I think it's going to happen to Atlanta. You know, we're under agreement on all of Atlantic Station on the retail office and land. And we had great interest on that. Again, would not have had that even six months ago. So I think it's already starting to happen. But I think what's going to happen to that core plus asset, we're going to still see more capital on a national basis go to that mid-spring next year. And Atlanta's going to lag that just a bit. I think Atlanta will lag that, yeah, probably fall for Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of people point to this uh, tsunami of debt maturity as being a, a, a really, um, really scary issue. What, what's, your, what's your take on that? I'm very curious about what you think about that. Well, you know, I think, I think the statistics everyone's heard, there's, there's a trillion dollars of CMBS coming due in the next three years, and or more, uh, which you know is is it's a frightening number. I, I was speaking at a panel last week, and and one of the gentlemen from Allstate had an interesting statistic, which I'm going to forget the number, but the the important part of it was that uh, we were all concerned about 2010 and the five-year uh, CMBS deals that were done in 05. Uh, his the statistic was that 60 percent of those deals have already been repaid. Um, that's a good number, I think. It feels like a you know a positive occurrence. Um, one would argue, yes, but, you know, the 06 and 07 vintage may be a little more challenged, uh, and, and that may be true. Um, but, but I think the, the industry finds a way. Uh, I think that you're seeing signs of life in CMBS, uh, a number of issues that are out there in the market right now. Um, I think that, uh, as Stephen's report said, you know, the CMBS market would more than likely get back to a $7,500, $100 billion industry uh, reasonably soon. Um, I think you've got life companies that are very active. Uh, I'm hearing a lot of activity uh, with, with those, with core assets. And I think Mike's barbell analogy uh, applies here, is that the core assets that are financed with CMBS, you know, have a home and have a place to go. I think the challenges are going to be the ones that don't. And, and you know, getting out of par is going to be real challenging on a number of assets across the country. So those are sort of at that other end of the barbell of, you know, what do you do? And I think there's, there's embedded loss that's going gonna, it's gonna to have to get worked through. And unwinding, you know, the CMBS with all the tranches and, and all the different um, uh, people's opinions about what they want to do is, gonna, is just going to prolong the, the, the issue. So I think there is a funding gap, as everybody calls it, in, uh, in how we're going to finance the uh, impending debt. Uh, I'm confident that, that as an industry we will figure out how to do that. Uh, again, back from the 80s you know, um, and 1998 when we had the, the ruble fell and, and capital markets closed in 2001. Uh, it's a resilient industry. It's a resilient market. There's capital available. We will figure it out. My comment on it is we, we spent a lot of time talking about CMBS, and, and that's really only about one-fourth of our problem. You know, the other three-quarters balance sheet. And you look at 2009, probably 75% of the loans that came due 
just got extended, as John said, kind of kicked the can. That's what happened in 09 for a couple of reasons. One is the balance sheet lenders and the special servicers were just overwhelmed and understaffed, and the easiest thing to do is just to delay it and not have the conversation. Um, two is the, from a pricing standpoint, the capital markets were not in place to really see transactions occurring. There was no price discovery. And I think if the special servicers or lenders felt they had a good operator in place, a good owner in place, let's just extend it a year or two and then we'll deal with it then, you know, kind of pushing it out. What's happening now is, is we've been talking about the markets move, so there's a lot of price discovery and, and pricing is um, up appreciably over the last 12 months. Two, I think that the special servicers and the balance sheet lenders are getting their staffs in order and they can kind of, instead of having 50 properties they're working on, they're working on 20, so it's much more manageable. And those extensions are all going to happen one or two times. If, this, if the owner comes back a year later and says, let's extend it, and nothing's happened at the property, why would the lender do that? So we're going to see much more activity next year of lenders actually taking product back, either through the special servicers and foreclosure or through the balance sheet lenders and just taking the keys uh, once they go through the drive through and they hand them off. We're going to see much more of that next year because now the lenders are feeling a little bit more emboldened and there's a lot more liquidity in the market from the CMBS side as well as the balance sheet lenders, the, the mortgage REIT funds. And I think what's going to happen is next year we're going to see the pension funds get into the mortgage business more than ever been because they just cannot find returns. So this is a model. The U.S. pension system is built on a 6 to 8 percent return to fund retirees. And you look at the baby boomers and they can't go get it in fixed income or the security markets. They're going to get it in real estate, both on the equity side and the debt side. And we've seen allocations on the pensions funds go up $20, $30 billion this year, and they can't satisfy that appetite. I truly believe they're going to fill a void on the mortgage side next year. Yeah, I mean, simply, if the asset is worthy, and the operator, developer, owner, whatever you want to call it, worthy, the asset will get sorted. And if not, the lender will lose patience, whoever that lender is, special service or bank, pension, insurance. And that's where, to your point at the very beginning of the conversation, Julian, that's where the redistribution of wealth will occur. <laughs> that guy will have recapture, right. and Jeff and I will have an asset at 30 cents on a dollar. Absolutely. I mean, that, it's actually the healthy process that we've had all along. It just has it, to take place. It has to in order for us to heal, absolutely. Well, it sounds like we pretty much agree that although the capital issue was a huge issue for us that it's well on its way to being solved is everybody agree with that or am i overstating that it's still a problem it's you right. know it, it's kind of like a marriage um you go to bed the wife wants to talk and the husband doesn't want to talk and you wake up it's still a problem we still have an issue we got to deal with uh it's just gonna be a lot better in the morning than it but, is right yeah, now we see the morning now right right yeah good good what about the oversupply issue in Atlanta? We've touched on that in some other uh, presentations today. Uh, is that an issue that you're concerned about? Atlanta is a boom and bust town, period. And I think part of that is because we don't have any, uh, we've had a lot of population increase, but we also don't have any real barriers to entry from getting back to the regional Absolutely. thing. We don't have any regional, there's no, you know, we're not Chicago, we're not sitting on a lake, we're not Boston, we're not sitting on the ocean uh, or Miami. New York. So people, you know, if you looked at the cycle, and Jeff and I have been around for a while, and I guess, Michael, you have too, and, and uh, both Jeff, you know, nobody built south of Atlanta during the RTC crisis. <laughs> now you go, you know, 50 miles south, and you'll see, you know, a big power center in Henry County or beyond. So, you know, historically, Atlanta's a boom and bust. So we could sit here and say that, you know, what we call equilibrium in real estate is totally different than what you would ca call it in Washington, D.C. We, pr we think equilibrium probably in the office market in Atlanta is 12% vacancy. <laughs> Seriously. 10, 10 and, or 12% vacancy. And we've been li living that way for years and years right. and years. Right. 10% vacancy, maybe other, retail. Yeah. Now, you don't want to retail. You, you may not have 10% vacancy, but the others do. Uh, it's just like he's getting 30 or $40 a foot in Brookhaven. I can assure you that the guy down the street is not. So it just shows you the flight, the quality you know, of capital, which we've all been talking about. But the boom and bust cycle is something that Atlanta has been since I've been here in 75 when I was a pipsqueak, pretending like I was Ray Goff out in the front yard. 1975 was the year I moved here. It's always been that way. 
you know, from a, um, I think statistically, this country for the last 15 years has built 300 million feet of retail a year. I think the numbers look like that. And I would bet there's only been 30 million feet built in 2007, 2008, 9, 10, probably 11 through 12. So five years at a drastic reduction of retail, um, you know, is going to create some demand. You know, most of our retailers, our, our mass merchandisers we work with, are probably expanding at half speed from 2006, and that's probably where they should be. But most of them, their biggest concern is they can't find sites. They can't expand. There aren't developers uh, developing. Um, you know, they're not staffed to try and develop on their own. And um, they have a lot of cash on hand, and so um, uh, either they uh, pay a dividend or buy back their stock or they expand. And um, uh, mostly what we're hearing from our, a lot of our bigger retailers is, you know, what are they going to do next year and next year after that to expand? And um, um, so that's good for us, um, but it's just, it is this boom bust. I mean, it's nothing, it's nothing really happened for four or five years. It's, it's going to change. Um, in a few years. And Julian, you know, we're, we're in 2010. We're, America's going to see 100 million people in the next 40 years. And uh, my assumption is that it, Atlanta's going to pick up, you know, its fair share uh, of those, those people. So, uh, you know, is 142 million square feet office space too much? No, I, I don't know. I think it's a temporal issue. It is, I, I agree with, with John. It, it booms and busts, and it's somewhat of a trading market. And, and y yes, it overbuilds. Um, and, and it always has, it probably always will. Um, but there's, a, there's an alternative to that, which is sort of state-run communism or socialism, which you know, I think it's a bad alternative. So I think if we can, as Stephen said, you know, sell the city and put some sort of industry governance around how this works, I think it would be good for the city. Can we accomplish it? I think it's really challenging. And you know, if we make some headway, that's great. Um, but I think that's, uh, that's just part of the fabric of Atlanta, is we don't have the physical barriers to entry. Uh, we have some other challenges here that, that we need to solve as, as a group and as an industry and at least have a voice um, through the political system and, and independent of that so we can try to you know, salvage and, and keep the, the peaks and troughs a little bit lower. But you know, if, if, we had, if, if all of us had underwritten 40% you know, value decline, you know, five years ago, I'm not sure a lot would have, would have gotten done. Right. Well, and advice is, I mean, Jeff will tell you, I'll tell you that in town's better than out of town. That's just the way it is. And, uh, you know, you've got a chance in a commodity market to be a non-commodity when you're in town. And that's the reason why he's getting $40 a foot, and that's the reason why, you know, we have done so well in Midtown. Because we, we're not only we in town, we're saying we're staying on Peachtree Street. Somebody calls me about West Peachtree, I'm not interested. They call me about Atlantic Station, I'm not interested. You know, so we're a bit laser focused on trying to create uptown. I'm trying to create a market in, with its own market, and, and it's not a commodity. It's, it's hard to, to get into the, on Peachtree Street between you know, the SCAD school and, you know, uh, North Avenue. That's... Mm -hmm. It's hard to get there, and it's hard to get a deal. Believe me, you can read about it in newspapers. It's hard to craft a deal in Brookhaven. But once you get it, tenants will pay you $40 a foot. And so that would be the advice. You know, of course, I guess I'm asking for more competition, Jeff. But in Atlanta, which is a boom and bust, commodity-style town, you want to create an opportunity for yourself that's non-commodity. And if you're in Roswell, then try to get in the toughest place you've ever been in Roswell. Uh, you know, where they've told developers 15 years no, you know, try to create a project that gets you approved. Uh, if you're in, you know, Sandy Springs, same thing. But I think it, the, the closer you can get to Buckhead Midtown with your projects, the better you'll be in Atlanta through the downturns because they're coming. And so are the upturns. Upturns, you can build anywhere you want in Atlanta. <laughs> it works. <laughs>